Right, we're going to try this again. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, Cliff, you will see uh, when you join. So I've explained to him what to do and hopefully that'll work. If that doesn't work, I don't really know what to do because I, I'm not really sure how to make this clearer. Um, yes, so people are joining, but still no Cliff. Let me see if I can message him. Uh, where are you, Cliff? Um, that's so weird, it's not coming up. I don't know what to do because I can't join us. <laughs> he can't get on the conversation. Oh my God, this is a train wreck. And it's such a good interview. Um, perhaps I'll just do the whole thing and I'll just pretend to be him. Uh, no, I won't do that. Uh, right, so is there a way you can contact somebody else when you're live? Anyone uh, help me with this because he is not understanding this or getting it. I don't know, I'm trying to send him a message. Who else is on here? Um, ah, there you are. Right. So why can't I send him a message, but I can't connect with him? Bear with me, guys. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep trying this. Um, I have a feeling that his settings are locked or something because he's coming up that he's on here. But when I try and go live with him, that's not happening. So what we may do, if that works, I might have to go through his uh, Instagram uh, and then I'll join in. Yes, that's what somebody's suggesting. Um, oh, somebody sent a question. Hopefully it's a, um, can Cliff start a live and then send a request? Well, <laughs> I'm not hopeful. He says he's here, you can hear me. Great, so hang on, I'm gonna try. Oh, it won't, I want to, I want to go live with you. There you go, all right, is this gonna work? Is this gonna work? I might be connecting with you. Oh my God. Yeah! <laughs> every week, every week. I think it's becoming my signature. <laughs> I don't know. It's a bit, I, know. I think it's something to do with the UK. It's definitely nothing to do with the USA because we're perfect. I don't think so, mate. Because I, we know we tried this yesterday and it worked perfectly. So I'm yeah. getting into my computer here. Hi. Um, hello and welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, how lovely. Hey. What's going on with the book basket? Uh, I'm trying to look like Ethel Fugard. Well, I see. A uh, very renowned playwright, South African yeah, playwright, for those of you who aren't familiar with that. And a book basket oh, yeah. is Afrikaans for a goatee. <laughs> um, no, just trying something different, just having fun. I yeah. like it. I like it like, a lot. Well, welcome to Half Hall's Host. We finally got here. As I said, it's becoming my, um, my sort of signature thing, I think, that every week I can't connect with my guests. <laughs> <laughs> We got here in the end. Um, hi, Neil. And uh, that's the most important thing. So uh, because we only get an hour, it's 10 past now. I'm going to jump straight on in. Yeah. I'm going to minimize these comments here so I can see your beautiful face. Um, so I would start uh, mm -hmm. kind of when your parents have arrived in the United Kingdom and they've come, they've left South Africa due to the political turmoil uh, and the climate yeah. at the time, uh, right. apartheid. Uh, and you've come to London and you are an outstanding swimmer at this stage of your life. How old are you at this point? Uh, 15. 15. So outstanding yep. swimmer. You, um, I was going to say audition. That's not the right word for a swimmer, is it? <laughs> you do no. the time trials uh, for so, the Olympic Games. So what, I mean, yeah, to cut it short. So I arrived there when I was 15 years old. Yes, I had to find a school. I had to find a swimming coach who was going to get me to the Olympics. That was my dream. Of course, being with my parents, we found the right guy in Barnet Coptal, out near Edgware, where I lived. Uh, and I joined his, his squad purely as, as to train with him. He was the 1976 women's Olympic coach. So he was a very renowned coach in the UK. And I thought, okay, cool. If, if I'm going to get there, this is going to be a good guy to be with. So yeah, you know, three years later, um, I qualified at the time trials. They have lots of short course competitions and long course competitions and, and Olympic trials. And I swam the Olympic trials and my times qualified me for the 84 Olympics. Right. So after that stage, then we started looking into universities in the United States for me to get four years of swim training in the United States because that was the best thing I could do. Right. And you mm -hmm. were in fact awarded two scholarships to two different universities. Mm -hmm. 
And yes. then you did something rather uh, <clears throat> impulsive. And um, I wanted to start here because basically what Cliff decided to do, he was literally in the middle of a training session and he got out of the pool and went, I'm done. And much to your parents' horror, you go back to South Africa. But yeah. this thing is a pattern in your career and your life. I've noticed that what seems to others to be perhaps reckless and impulsive is not. It seems to be you have an unbelievably um, certainty and sense of self that drives you forward and that like a gut instinct that just guides you. Am I right? Yeah, definitely. I'm, it's funny. I mean, you, you know, when you emailed me yesterday, I actually I, I'm quite amazed that you picked up on that. But it's only because you know me, you know me by now so well. You've known me to give, you know, everybody who's watching a little background. They, of course, know everything a lot about you. Yeah. Uh, but not a lot of people know about you and me, our connection. And Sue Ann was super famous in South Africa, and I was nothing. I hadn't nothing. even been, I hadn't been known, seen anything. I happened, which we'll get to later. I joined an amazing show, um, and I got to meet Sue Ann, and Sue Ann really saw me come up from nothing uh, to become someone who was a public figure in South Africa. Uh, so she saw a very quick, uh, so Sue Ann, basically you've been there since the beginning of my career, right. which you have been, and it's I quite amazing. So yesterday, yeah. I was thinking the first time we met, which we'll get to Igoli, um, was when you were doing one of those massive road shows, which, uh, yeah. you know, there was thousands, like 50,000 people yeah. screaming Rugby and Stadium. everything. And basically, I was interviewing you. So here we are, 30 years later, who's Assange? Yeah. No, it's amazing. It's amazing. But I think that's why you've picked up on this, my instinct and the way I have these gut feelings. And I do. You know, when I got out of the pool in England, um, I had scholarships to universities, to Houston University and to Southern Methodist in Dallas. Yeah. Uh, they had the best swimming team in the United States, and they probably still do, called the Mustangs. And that was my dream, to, to join that team. Yeah. I swam one competition in from the UK. I swam for the for Britain in Canada. It was a Canada, United States, and Great Britain swim competition, and that was my first time I saw the Mustangs, the team, the Mustangs, and they were just phenomenal. It was the first time I'd really seen a team. It was like a football team or a basketball team. It was a real team, and that was my dream. I was like, I have to swim with those guys, and of course, they just killed that whole competition. Nobody could touch them. Uh, these were all Olympic, either Olympic hopefuls or post-Olympic swimmers that were in that team. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we applied to the universities. I got my scholarships, but during a training session in England one day at 5.30 in the morning, snowing outside or ice cold, I got out the pool. I sat on the side crying. Yeah. My coach, my, co my coach came. He put his arm around me. He said, you're going home. I said, I'm going home. I want to go into the army. I said, I need to grow up and I need to get a life and I need some adventure. Yeah. And that was it. That was the last time I put my foot in a pool. And then obviously when I went back and I got into the Air Force, I swam for the Air Force and right. was in the dorm for them two years in a row. So, yeah. yeah. So for those, so in case yes. somebody doesn't know what a Victor is, it's like the highest accolade a sports person can get. Uh, and yeah. you got it two so, years in a row, which military training in South Africa was only compulsory for two years anyway. Right. So right. basically for both those two years. So you sort of defy your parents' wishes. You go back right. to South Africa. You do your military training under great athletic prowess. Right. And then you come out. And again, there's this, um, that streak of utter kind of, uh, what did you always say? Persistent and just dedicated. You know what you're this doing. Perseverance, persistence, and... Uh, I've got to think of perseverance, perseverance, persistence, and preparation, maybe. It's the three yeah. Ps. But anyway, yeah, it's kind of one of my life rules. Not that I can remember it now, but anyway. So, so yeah. I, I love this. So you basically, you come out of the army, and um, you're doing sort of odd jobs, as many of us did in our 20s. And you're at a resort hotel down in Natal, I believe, in, in, yes. uh, in South Africa. Teaching windsurfing when, as luck would have it, you hear that the hotel um, sort of wonderful cabaret show, they need an acrobat. And mm -hmm. you're, again, that kind of confidence and slight chutzpah goes, yeah, I'm going to give it a go. Yeah. You get the job and you go yeah. from being basically in the Air Force to being a dancer. How right. is that? 
It was the most bizarre thing that ever happened. But I got to just, so going back on that one there, I, I always feel I have to keep moving forward. And I always relate it to like, I feel like a shark. If a shark stops moving in the water and he stops having water passing through his gills, he's going to suffocate. He's going to drown. And I always felt that in my life. I never gave it any conscious thought. But something always came up in me, like my swimming. Something made me get out of the pool and say, I'm moving on. Because what is the rest of my life going to be like if I stay in this pool? And I knew it wasn't what I, I don't know. I knew it wasn't want, what I actually wanted. Then I went into the army. I had the, the opportunities and they wanted me to join permanent force, PF, yeah. because I wanted to fly. I wanted to do all of that, but I needed to learn more Afrikaans. I'd come back from England. But something told me no. And also I, I was so tired. I got to a stage where I was tired of being messed around and I, I, I'm not going to swear here, but I, you know, being called religious, uh, yeah. pretty bad religious things, like we all know what goes on there. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this is enough of this. I've learned, I've gotten out of it what I need to get out of it. It's time to move on to something. I then looked for something. I found the water sports job down at the coast, which was amazing. Then this opportunity came up. And once again, that instinct kicked in and said, hmm. okay, well, if I stay in the hotel teaching water sports, where am I going to be in 20 years time with my life? Yeah. And something told me, move on. So yeah. I reluctantly went in and met the choreographer, Neil Mackay, who you probably know very yeah, well. Please great dude who's not with us anymore, RIP, but great yeah. guy. And um, he said, all right, show me what you can do. I did a couple of flick flacks and somersaults. And he said, all right, we start uh, um, rehearsals tomorrow. And two weeks later, I was in my first show at the Beverly Hills Hotel in Umslanga Rocks doing this stuff. And it was the weirdest feeling because even I asked myself, how did I get, I just really finished the Air Force. I was like, how did I get from wearing an Air Force uniform with eagles and now I'm on stage in front of people and they're clapping for me. I, like, I didn't know. I didn't know. Uh, but and all then, I knew was that I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, what I was doing. And then you quite literally tumbled into your next incredible life-changing experience, which led you to glorious Paris um, yeah. in the 80s, where you end up dancing with the Moulin Rouge. I mean, yeah. how? Do you have to tell us about that experience and how you ended up at the Moulin Rouge? Yeah, so so that happened. I mean, there was a long space in between. I, I became a professional. Yeah, I became a professional dancer in South Africa. I did cabaret shows. I did big shows like Sun City. Um, anyone watching? These are big shows, kind of like the, the Las Vegas shows. I did that for 12 years. I made a living out of it. I got pretty good at it. I was never a trained ballet dancer. I went to ballet class to get a bit of a foundation and a bit of technique. Um, but I made a living out of it for 12 years. And eventually, a good friend of mine uh, was principal at the Moulin Rouge. And he said, Cliff, one of the guys has broken his leg. Uh, they're looking for somebody. I've showed them your photograph. They're really interested in seeing you. Come in, come out, and come out. That's all yeah. he said. So I said, OK, cool. I was involved with a girl for seven years in South Africa. I told her I'm leaving. I sold my car. I put her on a, All I had was a little backpack. And I had maybe... I don't know, a thousand rand in my pocket, which is like a hundred dollars. Yeah. And I uh, got on a plane. I had enough money for a plane ticket and I went to Paris. Then I realized I had to audition. And yeah. I said to my buddy, I didn't know. I thought I had the job. I didn't know I had to audition. So now I thought, well, if I don't get the job, I'm stuck. I've got no more money to even get back to South Africa. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I auditioned. Luckily, they liked me. They put me into the chorus line. I stayed in the chorus uh, chorus line for three months and then the principal had to leave for whatever reason and they asked me to take his place and I ended up being principal there for it was like eight or nine months yep and um, I, I read your book so Cliff has written a book called my Paris nights uh, my year at the Moulin Rouge and um, I really I highly recommend it to anyone because it really gives you an insight into Paris at that time and also Cliff is quite raunchy I mean, <laughs> there was I mean yeah. there's just to give you an idea, everyone, there's um, quite a lot of dancing. Obviously, glorious Paris and baguette, uh, boulangerie, c'est très magnifique, uh, and ouais. feu de foncé. And then ouais. we got a little bit of prostitution, uh, diamond smuggling, and a lot of women. A lot yeah. of women. <laughs> you got to understand, I was in a relationship for seven years before that. Yeah. Now this was my first year on my own, and I was completely free to do whatever I wanted. Not only... And I, I was still recovering from being, I still had this feeling of uh, coming from South Africa that I was very 
tied down there. I was, there was a ceiling to everything I was doing. And all of a sudden hitting Europe at that age, 27 or 28, you're in your prime. You're just yeah. like, oh my God, I've got my own place, not sharing it with a partner, girlfriend yeah. or anything. Um, my own place, I have, I can come and go as I want. I can sleep all day if I want. So it was just a totally free time for me. And yeah, of course, you know, women came into that because I would, I was not interested in getting involved in anyone, but I was in the kind of business where there are just so many women, yeah. whether it's the audience or whether it's the dancers. I mean, we're in a place where there's like 40, 50 girls and there's like 10 guys, you know, yeah. and That's 10 and, and eight out of the 10 guys are gay. So, I mean, come on, our chances are pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, there you go, anyone. If you're good enough, that, that's how to meet gals. Head off to the Moulin Rouge. <laughs> there we go. Um, there we go. What would you say is the greatest sort of life lesson that the Moulin Rouge gave you? Um, it opened my mind and it made me respect. Um, I thought about this one because it was very good. It, it, it opened my mind coming from a very closed off society like South Africa. Yeah. All of a sudden especially my mind was. Especially at that time. You know, yes, South correct. Africa now is different, but especially at yeah. that time. Sorry. Yeah, at that time, it, we, we were in the, the height of uh, apartheid, the height okay. of everything. Every single guy I knew from South Africa had just come out of the military. We were all a little screwed up um, because everyone has their own experiences. But it was all of a sudden my mind was open and I respected this country so much and the history of this country, especially the history and the backstory of the Moulin Rouge. Yeah. It just, uh, that was the biggest impact on me. The first night we had a party and I write about it in my book. We had a party backstage and I took a bottle of wine and I walked down onto the stage. The whole theater was dark. It was, must have been 2 a.m. in the morning. Everyone was partying upstairs. I walked onto the stage. Everything was dark. I could smell the cigarette smoke. I could mm -hmm. smell the mustiness. You know that theater smell. You yeah. know it well. And I sat on the stage and I took a sip of my wine and I looked at this place and I was like, I cannot freaking believe I'm here. This you is did. like one of... Oh, yes. No, seriously, <laughs> you can hear it. It's yeah. like emanating out of the velvet curtains and out of the walls. And you can feel there's these, this not in a creepy way, but there's this ghostly presence in this place that yeah. was just so mind blowing. And um, so I, that was the biggest of it. I all of a sudden felt like I'd grown up, not as a man, as a human being. Yeah. yeah. And um, the book came about how? How did you come to write the book? So the book, um, I've always on and off been a personal trainer, one-on-one -on -one training uh, yeah. with people, personal fitness training, that kind of thing. And even when I was on Stargate, I was training people because number one, I enjoyed it. I would train myself. A very good friend of mine here in LA had a private training gym, John John Park. His father was the very famous Reg Park who inspired Arnold Schwarzenegger to become yes. a bodybuilder. John John and I used to swim together in South Africa. He was, in a, he was a Montreal Olympian. He swam in the Olympics. So anyway, he had a gym. Me and him used to train in the gym with a couple of other trainers. Uh, I met a new client and she happened to be a writer. And she said to me after training her for a couple of weeks, she was like, wow, she loved Paris. The whole story was like everyone else's reactions. Like you were a principal at the Moulin Rouge. Like people just do not expect that from me. Yeah. You know, Such a, like a, a boy. <laughs> 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 exactly. So she says like, we really, you know, you really got to write the story. I said, I have no idea how to do this. She said, listen, I want to partner with you on this and I will help you get it done. So I said, okay. And uh, so I just started writing down all things that had happened to me, yeah. incidents, instances that I remember, remember, excuse me. Um, and after about two months, I started having meetings with her. We'd meet for three hours a meeting twice a week. Right. And we would sit down and she would start recording me and she would make notes and make notes. She would then come up with a little bit of uh, like a page of writing and send it to me to get my approval. And I'd say no and yes and change things and do all of that. So we collaborated like that for over a year to get that book done. Because my main thing in the book is I needed it to be as real as possible. Right. Nothing was dramatized. And every single thing in that book that happened to me really happened. And the way it happened, she started to dramatize a little bit because she's a writer. She's creative. 
And I said to her, no, we need to pull that back. It cannot be dramatized at all because if I ever get questioned about this, I won't lie about it. If yeah. people say, wow, you really did that? I want to be able to say yes. And that crosses over, which maybe we'll get to later on in the show I'm busy doing now. Yeah. It's, uh, it's my personality. I want it as real as possible because I think that's what's the reason I did the book was I wanted it to be inspiring to people. Yeah, uh, and that's why I publicize, it's like publicizing your life. Yeah. I wanted to inspire people and I want people to know you can do anything that you put your mind to, but you got to be brave and you got to have cojones. You got to cut off and say, that's it for this. I'm moving on to that. Yeah. And I'm proof that it can happen. Yes, there is a little bit of luck involved, but I was ready and prepared to do what I had to do to carry on. Yeah. So that was my inspiration for writing the book was to inspire people. Tell them a great story, funny, sad, whatever, but inspire. Yeah. And exactly that thing of you kind of going, I've had enough now, it's time to move on. Because now you go from the Moulin Rouge back to South Africa, where you enter uh, the Mr. South Africa competition and win it. What does Mr. I mean, weirdly, we have pageantry in our past as well, because um, I hosted the Miss South Africa pageant, which I believe you may have danced at, but we didn't know each other then. I was, there. I was one of the guys walking the girls. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we've actually gone back for years and years and years. But yeah. just very briefly, because I definitely obviously want to get onto Stargate, just tell us very briefly what Mr. South Africa involved. So, yes, I came back from the from Paris and I got into full-time modeling, um, which I actually got pretty successful at in South Africa. And I met a great couple. You know them, Yanni and Yanni. Yanni and Yanni. Yeah. Uh, two of the biggest, um, what would you say, fashion show promoters. Yeah. And I would start doing a lot of fashion shows with them. And also because I could do acrobatics and flick flacks, we brought a different thing into a fashion show. Besides having a normal fashion show, I'd come down the ramp doing flick flacks. Right. People, it was kind of great at that time. Yeah. Yanni, Yanni actually pushed me to, hey, there's a Mr. South Africa competition. You should enter this. I think I'd entered a Mr. Rosebank before because my mom used to work for the Rosebank Gazette. Right. And she said, hey, look, there's this competition, great prizes, free trip to Mauritius and whatever. Just enter it. Yeah. And I entered it and I won. And I got a great, you know, great prizes, whatever. And then it, it was a while later, Mr. South Africa came along. And I was like, I don't know. Like, it's. I was kind of, sh I mean, I'm still kind of shy, believe it or not. It's one of those things. Anyway, they said, Cliff, enter the competition. And then I looked at the prizes and I saw one of the prizes was a walk-on roll for Egoli. Right. And then I was like, wow, France marks a walk-on roll in Egoli, like the top soap opera in South Africa. Okay, I'm entering the competition because that's that. what I want. I was going to say more than that. It actually was a completely groundbreaking thing for people who yeah. are not from South Africa. Um, we had never had uh, a kind of daily soap opera. And so this was a massive undertaking because basically it was a daily soap opera. It ended up running, I think, for 18 years and it made absolute stars out of every single one of its cast. And yeah. your prize was just a little walk on roll. So it's again yeah. that drive and discipline and perseverance comes through again in this story yeah. because not only do you win the competition, but you think, ah, oh, I don't want to just do a walk-on role. I want more. But you know you need to work for it because you're not an actress. So you study. Um, hello right. from South Africa. In um, right. my can you not say a Afrikaans praat of meer? I said, Natalie, Natalie, Natalie who? Okay. Who <laughs> can um, <Hukhan is> Natalie? <laughs> I see it. Um, Anyway, so of course, uh, Igoli then launches your career. You play Mitch for six years, was it? Um, sure, I got to think back. No, it was a little longer than that. It was, I think it was seven. I think it was right. seven years. And you become a massive, massive star. Uh, literally, where you're mobbed on the streets, which is again, as I said earlier, where we first met. And I yeah. just remember trying to interview you over thousands of people screaming your name. Um, yeah. Our name. No, I'm <laughs> and, it was uh, our name. It was, you know, it, it was quite something. And then once again, the Cliff Simon kind of hard hut, which is hard ass, <laughs> kicks in and you go, no, I'm done with here. Uh, yeah. And many people, and I get asked this question a lot from South Africans because we were both at the top of our games. And yeah. We both chose to leave and go yeah. to one of the hardest cities in the world, which is Los Angeles. Yeah. 
So what prompted your move and why did you go there? So, um, yeah, just to, I'm just going to backtrack because I, I get a lot of questions about this, about like when I joined a goalie. Yeah. So, and it ties in with the whole thing about taking chances, believing in yourself. Like you have to believe in yourself that you can do something. If you, there's no such thing as failing. If something doesn't work for you, you move on, go to the next thing. You can't look at it as failing because you rather that age old saying of, I'm, I'm going to try, I'd rather try and fail than not try at all. Yeah. And that's been my entire life. And it still is. So when exactly like with the goalie, I had a walk on role. I met the producer. He said, okay, great. You've got a walk on role. He's one of the top producers in South Africa, France Marks. And I said, no, I don't want the walk on role. I said, this is what I want to do. And I want to train and I want to come on as a proper character in the show. And yeah. I want to be on TV at least three times a week. And he just looked at me and he laughed. I still remember that day so vividly. I was sitting in his office and he said, okay, I'm going to send you to a, a drama coach, Miller Lowe. Right. I saw Miller Lowe for three months. She called France. She said, France, I think Cliff's ready for to do one episode. That's when they came up with the character Mitch. They gave me one episode. Three months later, they gave me a permanent contract. So just as an inspirational story, once again, it's exactly what I've always done the whole time. And that'll lead into other things coming up. Um, so yeah, an absolutely huge show. We'd get mobbed in the streets. Yeah, you couldn't go to a restaurant without people coming up to you. It was insane doing those huge road shows to 20, 50,000 people. Um, and now I've forgotten the question you asked me, but you can oh, remind yeah. me. So you, you kind of give all of that up to go to LA, which is full of unemployed actors. It's a, I mean, immigration is hard at the best of times. And yeah. you know, you've done it once leaving South, well, you've done it twice because you came to the yeah. UK and you went back to South Africa and then you went to America. I've also done it twice. Right. And, you know, anyone watching this who mm. has had parents who immigrated to give them a better life or who's immigrated themselves, it's it's a really difficult thing to start again at the bottom, especially if you've been successful in your own country. So um, what prompted that move to, to L.A.? So once again, sitting on a goalie for seven years, which was absolutely amazing. The fans were absolutely amazing, just like the Stargate fans. Um, I, was, I sat there and I was working and I was thinking, okay, where is this going to get me? I wasn't thinking, hey, I'm going to go to, I never once thought I'm going to go to Hollywood and become a star. And that was, didn't even cross my mind. Yeah. All I thought about was, I want to keep working, but I'm bored. Because I got bored on the show. Of course, I got bored with the character. I got bored with working with the same people, even though they were amazing. It's that same boredom started to kick in. And I started thinking, okay, where am I going to be in 20 years' time or 10 years' time? So I gave the show up. There was other incidences that prompted me. For a couple of years, I'd been thinking about moving to the United States. Whether it was for acting or for whatever reason, I wanted to become a U.S. citizen. That was my big thing. Yeah. For whatever reason, I don't know. We had a few very violent incidences in South Africa. I was getting crazy there. I was, you know, I'd walk around. I'm not going to talk about negative things, but I always had two guns on me at all times. Um, I had break-ins in my house. Uh, I won't even talk about it once again, but things prompted me to, okay, now's the time to leave this place because I want to get on with my life. I hope this country comes right, but unfortunately, I only have one life. I don't have kids. It's going to be easier for me. I can leave now with my wife. And that was it. Um, I had a cousin. I've got a cousin in South Africa in San Diego who was an immigration attorney. Contacted him. I said, I want to apply for, for a green card. I want to do this properly. Paid him $5,000. And a year later, I got my green card. And uh, my wife and I emigrated to the United States. Gave everything up in South Africa, like you're talking about. I had $18,000 in my pocket. $18,000, and I came to Los Angeles, one of the most expensive cities in the world. <laughs> now I had to buy a car for me. I had to buy my wife a car. Yeah. I had no agent. I had no contacts. I had nothing. Yeah. Um, and I truly started from scratch. And yes, that first year that I was here, yeah, it was a shock coming from what I had. Uh, I mean, yeah, I went through a depression because I was like, I mean, I never once thought about going home because I didn't want to. I left yeah. South Africa, but I, I thought, okay, is there anywhere else? Maybe. Yeah. Um, but I thought, no, this is where I want to be. This is the top. If I'm going to do what I want to do in life, this is where I'm going to be able to do it. At least have the opportunity to try and do it. Exactly. Um, yeah, 
so we stuck it out, you know, and yeah, for the first, um, I think it was a year I was here and I was lucky enough, well, I went for an audition, I found myself an agent, I went for an audition for Nash Bridges and I got a guest star role in Nash Bridges because of my accent, I yeah. played a South African, it was just a lucky role um, and that was my first gig here up in San Francisco actually and of course, it was all like, I thought, okay, I've cracked the big time here. Yeah. We're drinking wine at home. It's like, wow, I've got the audition. I've got guest but, star. On you know, just... There's no celebration when you get your first big job. Uh, yeah. well, hi, Gary. Lovely to see you on here. Gary Jones is watching. Um, oh, hey, Gary. But it's, it's, you know, I remember my first break was Silk Stockings. And they passed um, the lead actor's girlfriend was, uh, whoever was playing it was fired. And I went in to read for a guest role and I suddenly had like, an arc and you know several right. episodes and i same thing i was like oh my god i'm here for big time i'm like yeah. i'm so famous now yeah <laughs> no that's exactly true um, yeah but you know what it is a big if you think back to it it's a huge huge deal i got yeah. my first job in los angeles purely from an audition not just not because anyone knew me and it was a guest star role and all of a sudden i was off going to make a couple of grand for that week i was yeah. like and i needed that money trust me um, so yeah, very, very happy for that. And it was a great experience. I mean, working with somebody who I at that time really re admired, you know, Of course. Um, and just getting back into the system and working. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so moving along now, yeah. you then meet a uh, lovely Michael Greenberg, who tells mm -hmm. you that he is working on a little show with a guy called Richard Dean Anderson. Dun, dun, dun. Um, and I got in touch with Mike actually before this interview, because I said to him, oh. You know, when someone, um, it's been really interesting researching my guests and, and finding out about all of you so far. And I said, I'd quite like to do something unexpected. And I said, have you got anything that you can tell me about Cliff when he was Val? Um, <laughs> which, like by that. the way, I'm just thinking we're missing an opportunity here for, you know, you're, it shouldn't be four badass chicks at the Moulin Rouge. It should be four, sure. not four, four, yes, because you were clones, four Val ass bad. Yeah. Anyway, it sounded better in my head. Um, yeah. Anyway, so Mike was saying that when he first met you, um, his son was about two at the time, yeah. and he said one of the first memories that he had of you was that uh, they went to meet you at the hotel, and there was a fountain, and you gave the little boy uh, a quarter, I guess, or something, and you told him to throw it into the fountain and, and make a wish. And the little boy was completely blown away, and afterwards, you said to him, what did you wish for? And he said, I wish for a bigger fountain. <laughs> and Mike <laughs> said, sadly, the fountain stayed the same, but Cliff became bigger. You know, the character <laughs> just grew and grew and grew and became bigger. And he was so proud of you. And Oh, Mark, wow. You know, that's, so nice. yeah. that's so amazing. Wow. I can't believe you spoke to him. I mean, I, I, tried, I try and stay in contact with Mike. You know, he lives out in Tennessee now and his horse runs. It's awesome for him. Um, but of course, you know, being out of so far away, we don't get to see each other or yeah. chat as much. But yeah, I mean, well, that's such a cool story. I'm amazed Mike remembered that. Um, but yeah, I mean, do you want to know more? Well, <laughs> no, no, I think we're going to stop here. No one. <laughs> so what everyone, well, what I want to know is how did Val come to you? How did the role come to you? So, yeah, so Mike, <clears throat> his wife. And I used to dance, and we met yes, in South Africa. She's also South African, isn't she? Right. Yeah. So I knew her previous husband. We knew them. They, they, he used to be in a band in South Africa, and that band played at my wedding. So there was a lot of connections right. um, in there. Um, so I met Mike when I came out here through Nikki, of course. We went to meet her at the beach or whatever, probably at the hotel. Come meet Mike Greenberg. I had no idea who Mike Greenberg was at all. It was just some guy. She said, yeah, he's in the movie industry, whatever. I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm not the kind of person at all, like, I'm going to pounce on this guy, like, hey, and just talk about me for a half an hour. Because by the time I got here, and being for seven years on Igoli in South Africa, I kind of matured. Of course, not as much as I would have liked at that time. But I mean, that's just an age thing. But I kind of matured as an actor. And I learned so much from Franz Marx, who was the producer in South Africa. And he taught me a lot about talking to people and being an actor. And he used to, we used to sit and talk a lot. I used to go out with him a lot. And he used to say to me the whole time, the worst thing an actor can do is push himself on a producer or a director yeah. because it's such a turnoff. Because being Franz Marx, who he was, 
the one and only Franz Marx. He used to get it every single day in South Africa. Exactly. So it kind of sunk in and just stuck in my subconscious. And I wasn't that kind of person anyway. Mike and I were walking along the beach in Venice, taking his little kid for a walk along the beach. And out of the blue, Mike said, do you know, have you ever watched Stargate SG-1? I said, you know what? I watched like a little bit of an episode the other day. I mean, I know Richard Dean Anderson, who MacGyver is in it, uh, which is phenomenal. And um, I said, it seems like a really good show. I mean, you guys, you know, it's really popular. So he said, yeah, I know it's doing very, very well. He says, but, and I think these were his exact words. He says, I think you do very well in the show. And I was like, wow, okay. I said, well, I would love to be in the show. I mean, I'm available. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And that was all we said. We yeah. didn't even discuss it. But Mike had known me for about three months at this stage. So he knew what kind of person he, I was. He knew I wasn't pushing him. We didn't speak about the show at all. And we never spoke about acting or anything to do with the industry when we were with him. Or when I was with him alone, we spoke about his kid. We spoke about Vancouver. We yeah. spoke about horses because Nikki's a horse rider. Um, and I think he respected that, mm -hmm. that I never pushed him. And he approached me, which was amazing. So about a week later, I got a call from Paul Weber at MGM. And he said, hey, Cliff, we'd like you to come in and just read for us. We don't have a character, but uh, we want you just to read a script. So I think I read one of Tilk's scripts. And uh, then Paul said, okay, great. You know, we'll, we'll be in touch. And I left and I, I kind of was like, I don't remember feeling happy or anxious or sad. It was just, okay, I did it. Yeah. I knew there wasn't a character. And it was a month later I received in the mail I received a script, an episode script yeah. for the first episode, whatever it was. And uh, I read through it and they said, you're playing the character of Baal. So I read Baal and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing, dude. Because now Mike had obviously told the writers as much as he could about me, the kind of person I am, yeah. the kind of accent I have. So in essence, the, the character was created probably mostly with me in mind. They might have started writing something, but then when they knew more about me, uh, they obviously embellished on what they were writing. And, um, you know, Mike obviously told him about my kind of snide sense of humor, very similar to yeah, Richard's. I was, I was just going to say, is that there was, you know, you became a fan favorite very quickly. And yeah. that kind of slightly sardonic, wicked sense of humor, was that on the page? Or? No, no, it wasn't. It started off, the first and second episodes I were in was just very straight. And I could see the way they'd written it. They didn't put any kind of personality to it because they didn't know who they were dealing with. But then the first episode, which all the fans know about, every convention I've spoken about this, Osiris came through the sliding doors. All the system lords were sitting, all trying to be ultra tough and ultra cool. And um, she came in through the doors and I took one look at her and it just was purely instinctive. Once again, I slid down in my chair, I crossed my legs, I did this on my face, and I looked at her up and down because she had legs that went all the way up to her neck. And I just looked at her like a, like a guy looking at a woman yeah. who's appreciating what he's seeing. And I heard like a little gasp kind of noise coming from behind the camera. And I know that was Martin. Yeah. I know it was Martin because they didn't expect that because we were trying to be like, we're system lords, we're tough and yeah. whatever. Yeah. In that instant, I decided I'm going to play this guy as a human being as a funny guy, and it just worked. Yeah. I, it, it could have gone either way. We walked out of the studio, and I walked out with Martin and with Mike, and Martin said to me, don't worry, you're coming back. Yes. And that made me feel really good. That's um, so that's how that whole situation worked. So it's not that Mike, yes, Mike Greenberg put in a good word for me for the show. I didn't really audition. I just read for them. Uh, but it was up to me to now prove Mike right, because Mike took such a chance. If I completely balls the whole thing up or acted like a complete asshole on set, yeah. his name would have been completely messed up and I couldn't exactly. do that thing. So I really wanted to just be at my best, you know? Yeah. And that somehow gave me the confidence to do that with the character and really take charge of the character. And for the first time in my life, I decided I'm gonna do what I wanna do on screen and not just what the director or the writer is telling me to do. Yeah. And then they followed me. From that day on, nobody ever told me how to play the character, and the writer started writing the humorous lines for me. I yeah. think also sometimes those instinctive moments that actors have are absolute gold. Um, 
I had a moment which unfortunately didn't make it onto the show. But I reckon if we were to do it today, it absolutely would. And I had a a line where I look at Amanda and say, uh, you're an exceptionally beautiful woman. And I took my finger down her face. And in one of the takes, I licked her face. I just leaned forward and licked it. And Rick was like, yeah, I know. was like, oh my God, but they, they loved it. And I think, yeah. was, like, I absolutely just think it was because it was so long ago. Um, yeah, but you know what, you've got to take, you know, you take chances like that. And if it works, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. And you've really got your own way. And that's so satisfying as an actor, you know? Yeah. And for me, the years of playing ball was absolutely satisfying. Like, so satisfying to go back there because I knew nobody was di- going to dictate to me what to do this week in this episode and I had yeah. total freedom and I've always said that about playing the hero or the bad guy playing the bad guy you have so much freedom to do whatever you want because nobody can tell you how to play a bad guy right, right you know um, so you became the longest running system lord yeah. much to my chagrin <laughs> <laughs> um, come on I can no. read really red um, anyway it's a stupid line um, and I mean, massive fan favorite. Uh, you, I mean, I, I sort of whipped through several episodes because I was reading the book at the same time as well. And again, that sense of you, um, and I really admire this, I think, in your work, that Cliff Simon the man is quite separate to Cliff Simon the actor, as it should be. And sometimes uh, that's not always clear with people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think with you, it is. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's a real compliment to you. Yeah, no, it is. Thank you. I mean, I've always, I've always tried to stay as down to earth, and you know, another big rule in my life is always stay true to to who you are. Yeah. And I've always, always followed that rule, and I've always said, even if there's there's a reel I did a, a reel once, it's like, you know, acting is what I do, and it's not who I am. Yeah. I don't believe anyone on this earth should be defined by what they do to make money or make a living. Yeah. Because the person behind that is so different. Like, there's a ton. I mean, so many celebrities here get such a bad rap. It's because sometimes they put on the celebrity attitude instead of just being themselves. Mm-hmm. Because when people get to meet them, so often people meet celebrities and they go, oh, God, he's so nice. Yeah. Like, why do they say that? Because Does that mean they're coming across as not nice when they're on screen or being interviewed? Like, just be... So anyway, I'm a big believer in keeping that separate. Keep, I'm keeping my work separate from who I am. You know, who I am is what I, I love animals. I love the environment. I love surfing. I love the ocean. That's what I do yeah. to relax. If I could live and make a living off that, I probably would do that. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But absolutely. I mean, actually, like, if a guy's a dentist, don't judge him because he's a dentist, whether he's a nice guy or a bad guy. It's like, that's just what he does. You know, yeah. get to know the people behind him. Exactly. So, that's, yeah, that's always been my 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 rule <laughs> good rule and uh, and i think it's paid off um i'm chronically aware of the time because the last 15 minutes will be for um to, to answer fan okay. questions of which people have sent me quite a lot so um i'm going to whip through some of these because i still want to talk about uncharted mysteries and the americans yeah. if there's time yeah um where's the craziest place that you've been recognized as ball okay i have to tell you because it's very funny i'm glad you asked that because only Probably two, two, three months ago, before this whole lockdown started, I was uh, with my wife at Italy in LA. Yeah. Italy, for those of you who don't know, it's a huge indoor, mainly Italian-based uh, market. You can buy cheeses, breads. Uh, anyway, it's huge here it's in the amazing. States. And yeah, it's amazing. And um, I was standing there at the cheese counter, which is just unbelievable. And uh, my wife was there and her sister and the kids. There was a whole bunch of us. And... They were looking at the cheese and deciding what to get and cutting pieces and tasting it and tasting it. And then eventually, about uh, after 10 minutes, the guy behind who was actually cutting the cheese, who's like a cheese connoisseur guy, <laughs> tattooed and but looking yeah. real chef kind of like mod chef, you know, he said to me, oh, it's such a pleasure to serve a god. <laughs> and I kind of like stopped and I was like, did I hear him right, you know? Yeah. And anyway, he's like, he's like I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> And that oh, was just so funny. I, I said to him, oh, that's so amazing, dude. Thank you for not making a huge thing out of it. But it was like, it was a completely, it was a place where I completely did not expect to be recognized. Yeah. Uh, just like once quickly, be when I was on a goalie, 
uh, when I went on my honeymoon, part of my honeymoon was in Paris, and we were in the elevator going up the Eiffel Tower, and there was a group of South Africans, a family, and they went, Mitch, you found it. Yeah. All of a sudden, I got all insecure because like, I'm in the elevator going up the Eiffel Tower, and somebody's calling me Mitch. Yeah. It was so weird. It was that kind of situation. So, yeah, Italy was the, the weirdest place I've been recognized, for sure. I had <laughs> a similar honeymoon story in that um, we went to Egypt for our honeymoon and um, we were in the museum like we had one day because we were like we have to do the museum and yeah. this woman who's our guide was like and this is uh, goddess Hathor she's a very beautiful goddess and um, I don't know why she's from Russia but anyway <laughs> <laughs> so my husband and I are laughing and I was like oh um, you know I played goddess Hathor on American television nothing she was not having yeah. any of it that yeah. night the episode aired on egyptian television oh wow and the next morning she had to come and pick us up to take us to aswan and she walks into the hotel and she's like oh my god it wow. is a hathor you are hathor i feel wow. like and it was amazing we didn't have to do anything ever again wow. that's amazing and you were like right in the epicenter of where hathor lives exactly exactly and also in her that's temple cool. we took pictures and I'm yeah. covered, I have to find this photograph, but covered in all these orbs, like covered, not just one, wow. covered. So I was like, she approves. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, wow. So tell us about, talk us through your last day uh, on Stargate, which was Continuum, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, so, conti feel? so Continuum was amazing to shoot. It just felt like a super duper big episode, you know, a lot more money and bigger sets and all that kind of stuff. Um, but once again, the exact same, I had the same feeling when it ended, I was upset that I wasn't going to be working because you don't know as an actor, you don't know what, you, this could be the last day you ever work in your life. Yeah. You never know. But I had the feeling like, okay, that's, that section of my life is over and it's time to move on to something else. I don't know what that something else is, but I had that same feeling of when I got out of the pool. Okay, let me move on to my next adventure. What's going to happen there? Um, so that kind of feeling. So I wasn't upset. I wasn't sad. I was kind of excited about, okay, where is all this going to lead to now? Yeah. All these, my time on Stargate, what's that going to lead to? Is it going to help me with other stuff and down the road, which it has, yeah. obviously. Um, so yeah, I wasn't sad. I thought it was the right time. And I, I was without a doubt, any show that lasts 10 seasons, super successful, and that's the right time to end it. It has to end. A yeah. lot of people in the industry don't understand it. It has to end. And as an actor, you want to finish in a show when the show's on a high. You never want a show to die and be in that show. Absolutely. It's just not, it's not a nice feeling. So we all ended. That show was tops, the best in the world sci-fi show, and that yeah. was it. And it was a great feeling. It was a success, like winning a gold medal, you know? Yeah. And now we need a spin-off show where we have a showdown because my great oh, yeah. regret is that you and I never got to work together. I know, so me too, me just too. Just putting it out there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, we're going to have to cover your last two jobs in like three minutes. So yeah. um, I want to very briefly just talk about The Americans because it's such an amazing yeah. show and you're really fantastic in it. What Thank was you. that experience like working with Matthew Reese and the amazing Kerry Russell? All right, it was amazing. But now I'm hoping, I know Paul McGillian was, was retweeting us. Paulie, I hope you're watching. I can't see the writing because I don't have glasses on. But <laughs> it was all thanks like to it. Paul. It was all thanks to Paulie because oh. I, was in New, I was in New York City. My wife was uh, there doing some kind of conference. So I went along and I got a text message from Paul. Hey, Paul, hey, Cliff, the Americans are casting for a character that's perfect for you. He plays a Mossad agent. He knew I'm Jewish. He knows I've got family in Israel. Uh, he knows, like, I'm very into, I mean, I won't go on about what my family or my brother-in-laws do, but I know that whole world. So I called my agent. I said, get me into the audition. I'm right here in New York now. I just don't have photographs. I don't have anything. Within 10 minutes, she called me back. She said, Cliff, they want to see you now. So I walked to, like, 10 blocks to wherever the casting area was. I was so relaxed because I didn't really know. I walked in. I'm like, hey, guys, how are you doing? Sorry, I don't have any photographs. I have nothing with me. Yeah. I'm just in New York for a couple of days. No, 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 it's fine. Let's do the scene. And you know what? I did that scene. It was like, it, it just was perfect. Yeah. We, I did the scene. I did the, the part of the scene was where I was tied up and I was talking with Matthew. And we just had that real low, slow conversation about yeah. 
me doing Mossad and what it's like to live a, as a life of as a spy. And we did that scene and it felt so friggin' amazing. I think because I was so relaxed, like yeah, I might I probably won't get this anyway, but let me try it. And I got the job and it was unbelievable. So I came back to LA, packed my suitcase really, and moved back to New York yeah. um, for a couple of weeks to go and shoot. Matthew was unbelievable and Kerry, just the most down to earth, amazing friggin' people because they are so accomplished. And I was blown away. I walked on set and they were just like, hey, how are you doing? Come sit down. None of this like, we're sitting over here, you go sit over there. Yeah. They just pulled me in. So I was sitting with them and the producers and everyone from Joe Weisberg, the creator of the show, uh, Joel Fields, the other producer, they would all just sit around with us on set because that was the vibe. And, you know, Joe Weisberg, all the stories on the Americans were real stories taken from his experiences. Yeah. Um, a, a unbelievable experience, the most professional, one of the most professional shows I've ever worked on. And definitely the most, I'm, I won't say the most, but probably, I mean, yeah, for people of that level, Kerry Russell and Matthew Reese, unbelievable people and probably some of the best people I'm going to work with in my life. Well, yeah, it's it's uh, really well worth watching um, both episodes, but particularly the one where you are, are sort of chained up and, and have that fantastic, fantastic duologue. Um, I can talk about that more, but I haven't got time. So yeah. uh, that brings us neatly onto uh, Uncharted Mysteries, which the last time yeah. I actually physically saw you, you had just completed filming all six episodes, which uh, sh uh, is aired here in the United Kingdom on the History Channel, and it's fantastic. Um, Thank you. I think, I remember you saying to me, this is probably your best job ever because it's the closest fit to you as, um, kind of as, as a man. It, it combines all yeah. your skills, all your passion, skills right. and passions. Uh, so tell us how that came about. <clears throat> okay, so, so first of all, I met Robin Keats, the creator of the show, about five years ago. Um, and just to, well, let me go back a little bit. So this is one of the spin-offs of being on Stargate. Yes, I got recognized for having been in the United States pretty relatively short amount of time. Um, I'd, I'd been wanting to do some kind of reality show like that. I'd written a lot of things, which I still have on my computer, never really got past that. But Robin Keats approached me. His wife uh, does a show called Pitbulls and Paroles, which a lot of people might know of. Yeah. Very successful, like 10 season reality show, helping prisoners. Uh, using pit bulls and all that kind of stuff. Now, her her husband, Robin Keats, is the creator of my show. She had a show for me with pit bulls, which never worked out. He then approached me to do a show like this, which was called, at that stage, I think it was called Altered States. And he approached me because of my background, what I've done, being ex-military, um, and the kind of person I am. <clears throat> and that's, I'm glad you wanted to talk about this, because I wanted people also to know that there's a Cliff Simon who had a life yeah. before Stargate. And that's the real Cliff Simon. The, the, not the actor Cliff Simon, the guy who struggled through a lot of things, who used to spend six and a half hours a day swimming in a swimming pool, who went into the military, who saw a lot of things that are really horrible, who had to do things. You have a tough time. Anyway, you learn a lot of things. You grow up as a man, but you learn amazing skills. And I wanted to show that. I, I just wanted to be me in the show. And this came along. It took four years to get together till eventually it got greenlit. Uh, it's going to be released, I think, in November or later on this year in the USA. I don't want to say right now the channel that it's going to be on because they didn't really want us to say because anything can change. Yeah. But it's going to air this year. Hopefully we get a season two the beginning of next year. Um, but it's a show that I wanted to do and just show who I am. Everything that happens in the show is real. There are no special effects in that show. What we saw, what the camera saw is what we saw. The, the, there are certain sounds that happen. Those are things that really happen to us. I know you had one of your questions about the scariest things. I was in North Carolina at 3 a.m. in the morning with a whole bunch of people, and we heard growling, yeah. like very, very close to us. And we kind of moved slowly away, and we got tracked back to the cars. So everything they're hearing and seeing is real. My big thing on the show with Robin was that nothing is going to be staged in the show. That's why people will see. We're not going to make up a creature. We're not going to show a flash of Sasquatch running across the camera no. because that's not what happened. And people are savvy to that. We also didn't want to pretend I'm on my own in the wild because the audience are too sophisticated for us. It's been done. It's crappy. 
I bring later on in the episodes, I bring my crew into it. Yeah. We're not trying to hide the fact that I have three or four guys with me, but these are adventurous guys. If I climb a mountain, they climb with me. If I go across the river, they go with me. If I have to go underwater, they go with me. These are tough, tough dudes who they scuba dive. They're like specialist adventure cameramen. Yeah. They will go rock climbing with somebody and filming. So that's what's phenomenal. So, you know, I just wanted people to know that that's, that's Cliff. And it's an important thing because people are going to say, oh, yeah, but like, you know, what was that? I just want everyone to know that being the real person that I think I am and that I've always portrayed, I needed that to come across in my show. Yeah. So nothing is generated and everything that the audience experiences seeing is what we actually experience in that show. And some of it's freaking frightening. Yeah. So if we take the time, we go out to extremely remote places to get to where these things have happened. The people I'm talking to and interviewing on the show are the real people that these things happen to. And they believe it happened. My whole take on the show is like, okay, I want to see things. I want to experience things. But if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. I'm just a guy, an adventurer who has certain skills that I can survive out there if I have to. I can take care of myself. But I also want to prove things scientifically. If we can't prove it scientifically, then let's talk to people. Let's see what they're thinking. I'm not biased anyway. I'm not biased against somebody who said <clears throat> they saw an alien coming out of Mount Shasta. If that's what you saw, that's what you saw. I go out and try and see that alien for myself. That's all. Very remote, very adventurous. I mean, there's places that, you know, we hike for three, four hours to get to places. And we've been through some dicey areas, like where I wished I had a couple yeah. of guns on me. But anyway, so an amazing show. So thank you to Robin. Yeah, he saw all of this. And, you know, we got a great show, I think. And um, we'll see Absolutely. after it airs in the USA. Yeah. I, I, I really urge everyone, if you haven't watched it yet, to please watch it. Um, it's, it's outstandingly good. I love the Brown Mountain Lights. Oh, and I remember us at dinner, talk, you were talking about it, and uh, Jacqueline Samuda and Peter Williams and I, we were like, tell us more, tell us more. I remember, yeah, <laughs> you know, the Brown, the Brown Mountain Lights, quickly, it's, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. Oh, I've, already yeah. had a few, I I've already had a few people saying that, oh, it's been doctored, the pictures. No. no. I saw your when we were there pictures. filming... When we were there filming, all the wow. people don't know if it's a geographical, atmospheric thing or if it's a paranormal thing, but that's what I'm there for. What I saw, what the camera saw, is what we saw. The sun had set and we saw the lights. There are no roads in that area. No. There's nothing. You can't get there. I hiked to try and get close to that area, which was freaking frightening. Um, but that's what it is. It's there. Yeah. It's a well-known fact. You can go there, and if the conditions are right with the humidity and the time of day, you will see the North Carolina brown mountain lights. It's not a myth. It's, it's a real thing. My thing was that are these lights paranormal, and are they communicating yeah. animals on the ground? Anyway. I may have to try and get you back because we haven't asked questions. It's telling me I've got one minute and 50 seconds oh, left. I don't oh, know if they'll let you do another one straight away. If not, I'm going to post the questions okay. to you and we'll try, answer yeah. them somehow that way because I promised everyone that we would answer them. Um, yes. Cliff, you're an amazing human being. Thank you for doing this. We're definitely going to run out of time for questions. Um, Thank you. Does anybody know if Instagram lets you do another one, if you just go straight back on and do another hour? I don't know if it'll let us do that. Well, we won't need another hour, but we can certainly get your questions done. Um, but I just thank you so much for, for joining us and for giving us your time. Um, of course. We'll make sure all the questions get answered, everyone, I promise. Um, yeah. And thank all right, you, thank you so, guys. so, so much. Yeah, I know. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who joined. And um, I hope you've enjoyed it, man. This is really nice. And thanks so much, Sue Ann, because I think this is great for us and for the fans and everyone staying in contact. And, you know, we're one big family. So let's keep on rocking Absolutely. and we'll all get through this. And but uh, try calling me back. Everybody, everybody just hang out. Keep watching Sue Ann's Instagram feed. Let's see if we can get back and answer a few questions. Yeah, absolutely. If we can't, if we can't, it's been amazing. Love you all. Love you, Sue Ann. We can't. With one last thing, they've asked us to say Jafar Cree together. Are you ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Jafar, Jafar Cree. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, guys. If we can't get back uh, next week, just.
those come up soon will be my guess. We'll be talking Stargate more, talk of other things. We need more time, but hopefully I'll be back at this time shortly. If not, I promise that I will make sure all your questions will be answered because I have questions that people emailed and I know questions have come up here. So, um, and also I'm going to save this to my story for y'all and watch it for another 24 hours. Thank you very much. Love you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's let me go live again so that's good hopefully people are still watching <laughs> um this way we can at least try and get some questions answered of course just got to try and get cliff back on the the line that's going to be challenging um cliff when you're ready join the conversation and uh hopefully i will be able to get your questions answered um god the biggest challenge of these things is getting the bloody questions on <laughs> connecting to the guests um Right, Cliff, are you there? Are you there? Uh, oh God, I can't even remember how I did it last time. Um, go live with, yes, Cliff Simon. And yes, waiting for Cliff. This is fantastic. So that's a sneaky little thing. That's just caught my eye. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, let's get some questions going. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm going to start cool. with the questions yes. that uh, were emailed to me. Um, yeah. When will Uncharted Mysteries be airing in Australia? Uh, oof, I have no idea about that, sorry. And it might not be called Uncharted Mysteries. The actual name of the show is Into the Unknown. Right. Uh, for whatever reason, History Channel in the UK decided to call it Uncharted Mysteries. It's kind of like the way they will rename a car because it appeals to that culture for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, I don't know when it's airing in Australia. I only will know when it's airing in the USA and Canada. Uh, but just keep watching your, you know, your local kind of your discovery channels or travel channel or history channel. Um, you will definitely see a lot of advertising for it before it airs. Um, the second question, I think you've sort of answered really, which is, will there be a second series of Into the Unknown, which you don't know yet? Um, yeah. But are there any mysteries that you want to pursue personally? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know there's plenty, there's plenty. I mean, uh, put it this way, I think it's looking, t it's looking, obviously this whole lockdown has messed things up, so I'm kind of glad it didn't start airing in the USA and a decision wasn't made to go for season two because we wouldn't have been able to shoot it anyway. So it's kind of good that everything was delayed a little bit. Um, on the positive side, they have taken the second option of for, for me, yeah. which means that the production company wants to do a second season, but it's up to the network now. So um, if we do the second season, they'll make a decision very soon after it's aired in the USA. Okay. And if the but dream yes. destination for you, uh, uh, what, would, what would be a dream destination for you to go to? Um, to Africa. I want to go to the uh, Skeleton Coast. Uh, I want to go to Swap of Munts and the whole down Walthus Bay area through the old diamond mining areas. Um, but another great episode which could happen uh, would be down in Mexico to scuba dive the cenotes. Uh, and go down, there's actual bones and um, things left from the Incas down there because in those days, uh, when people used to die, they used to throw them down the, the cenotes and they just used to sink down to the bottom or get sucked out into the ocean. So there's a lot of things to go see. That'll be extremely taxing. We're gonna be scuba diving, um, but gonna be really interesting. So I know that's on the cards and some maybe some really cool places up in Canada, up in the Northwestern territories, like really way out there cool i Bears. look forward to it uh, yeah. how many bones have you broken how many bones have i have been? never believe it or not i have never broken a bone unintentionally by mistake <laughs> never happened i have two i had two broken wrists but that was surgically broken because of all my acrobatics i had to get pins put in them that was all fixed up but i've never actually broken a bone wow yeah, God, yeah. touch touch wood no. <laughs> yeah. um, Somebody is saying, do you have any advice for actors starting out in their career? Um, yeah. Uh, I do have a lot of advice. It's like you hear the normal advice, like, don't do it. Don't leave your day job. You know what? Do it. I'm going to say do it because there's no more exciting job and no more better job on this earth than acting, whether it's theatrical acting, television, movies. When you're working, it's the best job in the world. When you're not working, it's the worst job in the world. Yeah. But there's nothing more satisfying. And if you find that that's your calling and you have something, you feel you're being pulled in that direction, do it. Like I said, you've got nothing to lose. And you know what? You never want to be my age one day thinking, you know what? I should have tried it because maybe it would have worked. Absolutely.
absolutely. And I so work with people as well. It's right. Exactly that. If you want to do it, now's the time to do it. If right. you're starting out, just be brave. And if it doesn't work, yeah. it doesn't work. But at yeah. least you tried it, you know? Yeah, um, but just be brave. That's it. <clears throat> how did you get into rescue dogs? Um, I had, when I came out from South Africa, I brought two bull terriers with me. Um, obviously, over the years, they both passed away. They were both, they lived a full life, you know. Um, and then I had a break from dogs because I just, I was so distraught and torn about my dogs dying. And there was no way I was getting another dog. And these friends of ours that I know work with rescue companies. And um, I started to get involved with the pit bull rescues that they rescue from gangs here. Whenever they rescue guys, they just leave the dogs in the house. The police call the rescue companies and the rescue people go and get them. So I started off by just like um, once or twice a week walking the dogs and then attending on a Sunday morning, attending one of the rescue days at like Petco, one of the big pet department store where they would do adoption days. And um, I just thought, you know what, I've helped. I have the time. So I would, I would get a crazy dog for the day. I'd pick him up, put him in my truck, and I'd drive him down to the beach. And I'd walk along the beach with him because he's cooped up in this little cage all day and it makes them insane. And... Um, you know, I loved it. I started, I did it for quite a while until eventually it started to get me down. I started to get too upset, uh, taking them back. <clears throat> I can't talk about it. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. And then anyway, I, um, <clears throat> one sec. Uh, then eventually I got my own rescue dog and, you know, she lived a long life and she died last year, unfortunately, but that's how I got involved with them. I just thought it was very important. And it was out of control at one stage, but <clears throat> the rescues now have really got a good handle on it. And believe it or not, with all this, what's going on with COVID, a lot of the rescue companies are kind of empty. People have fostered so many dogs because, number one, the staff have had to be less at the adoption agencies. And people have really stood up and gone to foster a dog for a month or two months until things calm down and they can go back. Or hopefully the people will just keep them, you know, as a rescue. So in a way, it's been a good thing, you know, for the dogs anyway. That's yeah. some of the risks I have to. Um, somebody yeah. sent a question on saying, have you ever met uh, Nelson Mandela? I guess it's um, for both of us because we're both South Africans. I didn't, unfortunately. I would love to have met him, but I never got the opportunity. Um, I was very did lucky you? enough. Yeah, I did. Wow. Um, and uh, I met him at an event at that um, MNET, the station I used to work for hosted um and it was incredible he he really was one of the rare ones that had um presence and a twinkle in his eye uh, just phenomenal yep. absolutely yep. phenomenal madiba exactly um, madiba it's a pity it's just a pity he wasn't released uh you know a lot lot earlier because he would have sorted their country out but anyway absolutely. that's a whole other story absolutely yep. Uh, this question is, if you could work with any actor in the world, alive or dead, apart from the lovely Miss Braun, and that's a quote, <laughs> who would it be and why? Thank you for that question, whoever that was. <laughs> you ruined my answer. Of course I was going to say Sue Ann Braun. Of course. Well, we have to make this happen. <laughs> We've never actually worked theatrically oh, together, no. believe me. Um, Unless we so, count our <clears throat> corridor escapades. Yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll redo that. Um, you know what? I really want to work. I really want to work with guys like El Pacino and Robert De Niro. Um, to me, those are just like they just men, man, and they are just at the top of their game. I do not regard them as celebrities. I do not. They they just. I I can't even explain. They're the epitome of acting at, for from a man's point of view. Yeah. They just do the job, and they just do it so well. So. Those two guys, if I could work with El Pacino or Rob De Niro, I would say I've reached the top of my career. And that's got nothing to do with money. That's not got nothing to do with, okay, well, now I've got $20 million in the bank. I'm set for life. I would be like, I've worked with two of the best actors in the world. I'm done. What else is there for me out there? You yeah. know, that kind of would be my attitude, really. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump to the questions here. I know there's somebody waiting with a question, and I've got a few more yep. here. But this question has come up twice now, which is, your favorite fan experience? Ah, uh, jeez. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to read into that. Um, I don't know. I mean, every 
every convention I, I have done, there's been some strange weird things happen or, um, and they all, but 99% of the time, it's all very good experiences from people and being with people and the feedback I've gotten. Um, I don't know. I could never really say which was the best experience or who was the best fan I've ever met. I just think all of you are freaking crazy and amazing and like yeah. just really enjoyable to be around. And yes, at conventions, when we take a break, we need a break because you guys are mad, <laughs> but um, in a very good way, in a good way. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. your energy and everything is so amazing. And that's why we have to take breaks because it's draining, yeah. you know? But so supportive, and the, the Stargate love yeah. is amazing. Yeah, um, yeah. The question that was emailed is, how good would a spin-off series be about Baal, and what would his origin story be? Wow, you know what, I've thought about that. I mean, you, you know, Continuum, the host, was still alive, and he's a very interesting character because he's a 4,000-year-old human being, and there's a reason, this is all in my head, there's a reason why Baal chose that host. So my thinking is that that host, that person, whoever it is, that human being, is maybe a more interesting character than Baal. Mm -hmm. Baal is just a big badass dude who wants to kill millions of people and run star systems and that. But who is the human being behind Baal? And I believe that the host body will have memories of that symbiote being inside of them. So he will have memories of what Baal did and what Baal saw and maybe things about what he spoke behind people's backs or when he thought he was in, in, you know, had privacy, what he did, this human being host would know him. So that definitely should be the backstory and has, would have so much information for the SG one team or whoever it is for the good guys uh, that could really help them where he comes from. I have no idea. I mean, you know, we all know there's billions and billions of planets out there. He most definitely is not a host from earth. Yeah. He's a host from some far off planet that's that's you know maybe a parallel universe to our earth. That's so that's what I think. So yeah, I wouldn't it would be I, like I wouldn't a, a prequel, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But a very interesting character for sure. Uh what is the one item you miss from South Africa? Um geez, I don't know, at the beginning of this whole lockdown when people here started going crazy and uh lining up at the gun shops. It, like ridiculous like yeah. for what reason all of a sudden i missed my shotgun because <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking these crazy people are running out to buy guns because they think the end of the world has come i don't have a gun i don't have a gun um no what i'm just gonna do? Can't shoot at a virus <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly um one item uh my maybe my original motorcycle i had there i had a brand new original kawasaki zx11 it was the right. first kawasaki ram air motorcycle it was phenomenal loved that bike and i used to park it right outside my front door amazing amazing yep. um so some of these have already been answered because somebody's asked again about the favorite destination for into the unknown um okay. but i think I, I don't know if they mean the favorite destination that you've already visited because mm -hmm. we haven't answered that sure. maybe you could do that no. So my favorite destination I visited, um, you know what, I loved them all, but I would say my most interesting destination was Louisiana. Uh, went to towns like Lafayette and we went really deep into the Chafalaya swamp uh, on the boats, alligators everywhere in the middle of the night. Louisiana is a crazy, crazy place. The guys I met, unbelievable guys who were like our fixers, who would yeah. organize it. The one guy who was like my personal guy, um, Jeff, unbelievable guy. I love him. He kept me laughing. But I wouldn't want to, and if he's watching this, you'll understand. I wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley at night. Right. Put it that way. Yeah. Um, I was at one stage, I was in the water, and there was a snake, a water moccasin, eating a fish right near me. And the, my director's like, Do you want to get out the water? I'm like, Let's just wait. Jeff goes and gets my machete because he now wants to kill the snake. Yeah. I'm like, No, no, no. We're not killing animals on my show, dude. We're not killing. I, I'm not a hunter. I don't want dead animals on my show. Even if it's a bear, like we're not going to kill anything. He wanted to kill it. But like Louisiana, most interesting people, the Cajun people, unbelievable. Yeah. From a different planet. Yeah. Yep. I, uh, 
I went to a wedding in, in New Orleans once. Yeah. And um, also very like deeply, deeply atmospheric and, yeah. you know, the mops yes. that hangs off the trees and the Cajun yes. and the voodoo and the, and I remember yeah. going to this wedding and there was this woman who was extraordinary. She must have been about, she looked about 150. She looked like a vampire. And yeah. she was sort of standing in the corner having a cigarette. Yeah. And she looked me up and down and she was like, am I wrong in understanding that you're an African? Yeah. And I was like, Crazy, uh, huh? yes, I'm South African. And she was like, because yeah. you're wilder in the drizzle <laughs> of snow. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. So let me ask, would Hathor have been a good queen for Baal? Sure, of course. So. Yeah. It's not Without too late, time. darling. It's not too late. <laughs> not too late. We, uh, we're we're going to have the prequel. Don't worry. Exactly. Somebody's saying, please tell us about, I don't know how you pronounce it, Almethia? 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 Oh, Almethia. Whoa, Almethia. I'm so glad we've got extra time because that's an important one. Yeah. Um, you know what? It's kind of, I kind of like, I'm not mad about talking about things that haven't happened because in this industry, it's kind of like it doesn't exist until I'm on set. And I also don't want to jinx. want to jinx things but it's a huge huge show this that's really in pre-production i wouldn't even say it's not even pre-production they're still trying to get financing almithia is a fantasy fantasy film trilogy film series um three books aj coots is the writer of the books they're in australia i went out last year to promote the first book i think he's already started on the second book now um, my character is called gray paw he is a like an obi-wan kenobi character he trains the young warrior to fight off the evil demons um it's a fantasy movie like i said i have two huge wolves that i can conjure up a black one and a white one and i can actually ride on them so it's that kind of movie uh he's always topless he's got uh wolf well, paw prints tattooed. <laughs> yeah he's got wolf paw prints tattooed across his body he's got long hair maybe that's why subconsciously i'm growing all of this i just yeah. want to be like oh uh, he's going to be that kind of character. They're hoping to get started shooting with us in 2021, and I really hope it happens. I mean, like I said, we never know, but it is a great, great project, and I, you know, I'm behind them with it. I've expressed interest in playing the role. I'm helping them with um, publicity. They can use my name to raise financing, but it's big, you know. It's and it's 50 million dollar budgets and stuff. So these are major movies. Is it, yeah. a, is it based on a on a comic strip or or on a previous in, in, incarnation or is it a, an original piece or no it's it's an original piece oh amazing yeah um, yeah so there's that and then there's another which you might not know of called um along with the same producer lynn santa who's in australia uh she has another project called land of the free which is about canned uh illegal well i wouldn't even say illegal it's about hunting in south africa um her meryl harrison who was the chief SPCA officer for Zimbabwe and Tippy Hedron, who runs a lying sanctuary up here north of who everyone knows from the Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. And Lynn Santa actually set up a kind of an undercover shoot back in 2000 where they got some special force guys from England or Australia to go with them to South Africa and film all the illegal hunting going on. Wow. So we're hoping to make a movie out of this. I play with the special force guy. Uh, who takes them there and does, who goes in as a hunter and films everything undercover. Um, so that's another big project that we're hoping to get going called Land of the Free. Because uh, we're trying to expose all these idiots who are these, you know, 
go out there and pay money for lions and it's just wrong and it's the days of that are are gone the yeah. sports hunting for you know big five trophies like trophy hunting uh, and other hunting's fine people go out and they hunt deer and they eat the buck and they that's fine they do that all over the united states i don't have yeah. a problem with we got a problem with trophy hunting yeah like exactly. for what you're killing a lion that's just about dead anyway that's been drugged it's yeah. like for what own ego like yeah. those days are gone we're not exactly. living in the 18th century anymore anyway those Absolutely. are two perfect. uh yeah. question how have you managed to retain your south african accent <laughs> uh, I haven't retained my South African accent. I just didn't try hard enough to do an American accent. Um, no, you know what? I think it comes from, there's been certain auditions I've gone to with the American accent, which is fine. But I, I've just retained that being myself thing. And you know what? A producer here once said to me, he said, Cliff, why do you want to try and become an American actor and compete with 100,000 other guys? When you go in for an audition, people will immediately lean forward and go, where are you from? Yeah. So already you're making a difference. You're a little bit unique. Take, for instance, Jason Momoa. Jason goes in for an audition with all dudes, and the guy standing at six foot three or six foot five looking like he does. He makes an impression. Yeah. So it's the kind of the same thing when you go in there with an accent that's a little different, uh, and you can do the job. I'm not saying like any, you know. They like the accent. The accent works for bad guys, um, bad guy roles, which I've always played, which is fine by me. You know, yeah. that doesn't matter. Um, but yes, I do admit not speaking with an American accent as much as I should have. Uh, I've lost out on a lot of auditions, but the audition, the the work that I have got has been memorable work. People have remembered it, even it might be less, but it means more, and it means more to me. Wow. You know, I I'm not the door. I'm I'm not the boy next door. I am not the Tom Cruise guy. Like, I would never get that kind of work, even if I spoke with an American accent. So it hasn't bothered me that much. It bothers my agents and my manager more than it bothers me. Yeah. <laughs> um, for anyone joining right now, just to let you know, because somebody just sent a question saying, what? Have I missed something? Why are you asking questions oh. now? <laughs> yes, this is the second live. We've managed to do two. Um, I think the other one was too long to save to my story. So it's gone. Uh, I've saved it to Instagram TV, which I've never used before, but oh, it will wow. be up on YouTube tomorrow. Um, and I will be launching a YouTube channel specifically with all the mm. interviews so you guys can go back and watch them all anytime you like. Um, uh, we're going to have to wrap up shortly because I yeah. uh, have to go to bed and have a very early start. But um, a question that's come up several, several times, and maybe we'll make this our um, penultimate question because yeah. I want to ask you one last question. Uh, the question that's come up is, what was your favorite moment? Uh, I think it's for both of us. Favorite moment on Stargate? I'll let you go first. Um, cheers. That's also a difficult one. You know, my favorite yeah. moment, my favorite moment, moment with everything to do with Stargate was when I'd receive an episodic script in the mail. And <laughs> I know I'm going up to Vancouver next week for two weeks to shoot. Um, just knowing I was working on the show was amazing. I never knew from episode to episode that I was coming back. I didn't have any kind of 10 episode deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have any kind of deal like that. It was every time I said goodbye to Chris and Amanda and all of those guys, I didn't know if I'd see them again. Yeah. Um, so seriously, the best moment for me on Stargate was every time I got that call, okay, Cliff, you're back next week. Um, the whole show was just amazing, very professional, slick, family i never felt like an outsider guest star every time i went back i felt like part of the family and i felt like a regular cast member that's how all these amazing guys cast crew production everyone made me feel and i'm the first people we would always see our wardrobe that's the first person you go in and see and it would always be big hugs and big kisses and how are you we've missed you so the whole show as a whole was my favorite thing yeah, yeah. I, I have to concur with that because I think like just also the warmth of the cast. Um, I was yeah. completely greeted uh, and treated equally. Um, I mean, I did have one comedy moment where the character is meant to be this exceptionally beautiful woman. And the very first time anybody ever saw me, I had like half my head in curlers because they couldn't decide right. if they wanted to use my own hair, which is curly. Right. Which I did show you, but I tried to cut my own hair. So this is my lockdown look because my hair is a disaster. Anyway, but I, so I was in curlers 
um, I had no makeup on and I was in a dressing gown and they were like, and this is the woman playing Hathor, uh, the most beautiful <laughs> woman. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But everybody was so, so lovely. Um, yeah. And also going through the gate was kind of cool. Just like on a kind of yeah. tech thing, just like going. That was fun. That was fun. I, always, I always used to mess that up. They'd be cut, Cliff, listen, you need to step through, like, it needs it needs to be quicker. I'm like, but I don't understand what's going on, guys. Like, why? But the timing is perfect. No, no, we've got to time it with the kawoosh. And I'm like, okay, what's the kawoosh? Like, this was like the, the early days. I had no idea what was going on. It was very funny. Well, your kawooshing got better. <laughs> so <laughs> it did. you have danced, you've swam, you've acted, you're an action man in a new series. Uh, what is left on Chip Simon's bucket list? Okay, so what's left? I think I'm at the age now where, well, for many years, I'm a sailor, just to add to the things. I'm a skipper. I'm a, I, can, I sail catamarans. I, I don't own one, unfortunately, yet. Um, but I'm qualified to sail and skipper 50-foot uh, catamarans. My aim and goal and dream at the moment right now is to buy myself uh, I have the catamaran in mind that I want. It's actually built in South Africa in Cape Town. I want to get a catamaran and I want to go to the Greek islands and I want to sail around the Med. And I'd like to spend about a year sailing the Mediterranean, um, all the islands, Croatia, and live on the boat. That's what I really, really would like to do right now. That's well, my dream and my goal. It's my goal. It's not just a dream. It's a goal. Well, if there's one thing that I know about you, my friend, is that that will become a reality because... I hope Everything so. I've seen thus far has been proven that. <laughs> I hope so. Thank you. Um, and thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Cliff, for joining us and for coming on for an well, extra half an hour. Uh, I'll well. save this to the stories, and obviously everything will be up on YouTube tomorrow for people to watch the whole thing if they've missed it. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Suran. Right. Lots awesome of love to, to you. you. Bye, guys. <laughs> love you. Bye. Love all you guys. Take care and stay safe and healthy. Absolutely. Bye. Absolutely. Bye. Yes, stay Bye. healthy, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.